If you'll open your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and keep your Bibles open because I'd like to read from some more verses uh, that will be pertinent to our message this morning. I want you to make plans to be here this evening at uh, 6 for our evening service. We're in the book of Revelation and we're going to finish up in chapter 1 hopefully tonight. Some years ago I asked my pastor when I was a teenager, I said, uh, Brother Wayne, what do you think God looks like? And he said, well go home tonight and read Revelation chapter 1. And uh, I guess the closest description you're going to get of what God looks like is found right there. And you find John's vision of the risen Christ. And of course there's much there by uh, way of great teaching as to what God is doing in heaven right now and what he expects of us. But this morning we're continuing our series of messages entitled Together with the Brethren. I believe in the local church. Do you? I believe in the local church. Now listen to me. A local church like this is the process God uses to take his message to the world. It's this church's responsibility and other churches' responsibility to take the gospel to the community and to the world. It's our responsibility to reach our brothers and sisters in Christ and help them grow in grace and truth. Be a member of a local independent Baptist church or a local Baptist church or a church that's preaching the gospel is very important. And here's what's important. We need to work together. The devil is a divider. Amen? The devil is a divider. He loves to divide. He loves to get Christians at odds with one another. He knows our emotions. He knows my weaknesses. He knows your weaknesses. He knows what can get to you and what can get to me. Then he will manipulate us around as believers. He'll manipulate us so that we'll have little spats with one another. And when you do that, it affects the church's ministry. I've watched churches, uh, not churches I've pastored, but I've watched churches disintegrate completely. I've driven through the hills of Tennessee and looked at churches, beautiful buildings closed down. There were days that there was preaching there and there was singing there and there was children there. But the devil got in the congregation and they began to banner back and forth with one another. The church closed its doors. I would pray that that would never happen here. Never happen here. We are to be together as brothers and sisters in Christ, one heart, one mind, to take the gospel to the world. God's been good to us, but Satan would love to do anything he can to get in this church, disrupt our fellowship, and see the church go down and close its doors. I want you to be wide open in your mind to that thinking. Now, the verses I want to read this morning are very pertinent to what I have just said. In Romans 12, verse 1 through 3, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. These three verses are very powerful and very potent concerning my attitude toward what I say, what I think, and how I react to others. I'm not to be conformed to this world, but I'm to have my mind renewed so I can be a life that lives out proof positively that the Word of God is, is real and it has changed my life. Now look down in verse 6. Having then gifts differing 
according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Don't let anything disrupt that because love is a powerful, powerful weapon in the hand of God, a powerful tool in the hand of God. When you see a church loving one another, are you listening? When you see a church that loves one another, that's a powerful tool in the hand of God. When a church family moves in to one another on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, there's hugs, there's laughter, there's joy, and then there's the standing and it for the Word of God. God can use that, but Satan hates it. He absolutely hates it. So he says, let love be without dissimulation. Don't let anything disrupt that in your home, in your church. Abhor that which is evil. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Now watch this. Distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. We'd always be looking around for people that we can help. Folk that may need a little extra money, may need some groceries, may need some clothes, always looking at that. Somebody that's going through a hard time, a difficult time, and you walk up to him or her and you say, brother, is there something I can do for you? Sister, can I help you? Let's pray. Let's just kneel right here now and let's pray. To say to somebody, I love you. To just call them and say, I've been praying for you. To send them a little note and saying, I've been praying for you. You know what that does? That just cements a church's love for one another and the members of that, of that church. Now look at verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. You know what the re first reaction to us is when somebody hurts us or says something? I'm going to get even. That's our first reaction. That's the first thing Satan throws at you. I'm going to get even. Let's get even. You know what the devil just loves? The devil just loves to see a church say amen at the end of the service. And people just go out the door and shun people. Won't say anything to folk. Won't fellowship at all. And just get out the door without saying anything kind to one another. I like this. As a matter of fact, remember we had several visitors here a while back and uh, they said to me when they went out, the thing I like about this church is you fellowship with one another. You don't just run right out the door. I like that and let's let it continue but don't let the devil kill it. Amen? All right, now watch. Bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward one another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now notice this, therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no, uh, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are, are ordained of God. You know what he's saying here? He's saying it's always good to see Christians loving one another. Loving one another. And then let me read Philippians 2 and look down at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it robbery to be equal with God. But made of himself no repetition and looked upon him to the form of a servant, and he was made in the likeness of men. 
And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the cross. Let's pray together now, and let's ask the Lord to speak uh, to us uh, in a very strong way as we look into his word this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for the powerful word of God, the loving word of God. Father, I believe that our church is at a point where you are about ready to turn loose your hand of blessing. I believe you're going to take us in places we've not been and do things we've not done, but I believe Satan is doing everything he can to put a stop to the ministry of this church. Our missionary giving, new missionaries that we can take on, we're almost up to 30 missionaries. You want that. You want to continue that. You want us to be loving, friends with one another. And I know, Heavenly Father, that uh, there will be people that will leave. They, they won't like uh, the preaching. They won't like this or that. I understand that. But, Father, I want us to be the church that you have called us to be. Now, I just pray that you will help us to be together as brethren and that we'll take the gospel to the world. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. I'm glad that I have a home in heaven waiting for me. I am so thankful this morning that if there was a trumpet to sound and a voice would say, come up hither, those that are sitting in this building this morning, that your life has been changed by the grace of God. The Bible says in less than a twinkling eye, less than one half of a second, you and I would be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. I'm looking forward to that, and it could happen this morning, but I want to say this, when I wake up of the morning, I ask the Lord to help me to do this. Let me make a difference in somebody's life. Let me be a witness to someone. Let me give out a track today that will make a difference in somebody's life, in someone's life. And... Uh, well, we were visiting uh, just just this yes, just yesterday, uh, visiting, and uh, we were going door to door, and we noticed down the street, here comes the Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, they're filtrating uh, the area, and they're giving out their their material, and there's that false teaching that's out there, and very few Baptists are doing it anymore. Very few Christians are doing it anymore. And yet the Jehovah's Witnesses are growing. The Catholic Church says bring in people. I could go on and on. And one day the Church of Jesus Christ will stand before him and will give an account for what we've done. And this church will give an account to the Lord for what we've done evangelistically and trying to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Will he say well done? I certainly hope that he will. It's my responsibility and your responsibility to take the gospel to the lost. And so I'm glad uh, that there's a home in heaven waiting for me, but I want to stay here as long as God will let me stay here so I can give the gospel out to people. When we go home, we'll be at peace. When we go home, we'll be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Won't that be wonderful? When he welcomes us home and that we see him in all of his glory and uh, no, we'll be no, there'll be no strangers there. We'll be united with everyone, but that's in the future. How long in the future? I don't know. But until then, we need to be faithful right now because we are pilgrims and strangers in this world. As soon as you sit down and you become satisfied with where you are, if I become satisfied with where I am and who I am, and I don't sing that old song to myself, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, then something is wrong. And I hope that that's your prayer, that you're growing in grace and truth and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He wants us to grow in practical, holy living practical, holy living. Now, it starts in the home, and it starts in the church. In the home, we ought to be loving one another, building one another up. In the church, we should be doing the same. The devil loves friction in the church. The devil will use any little matter 
any little conversation overheard uh, that might seem like gossip, uh, intent of bringing somebody down. Satan loves that. And the devil just loves to get us at odds with one another. It's a wonderful thing to walk in a church and you're greeted with a smile. You're greeted with a hug. And your brother or sister says, it's so good to see you today. It's so wonderful to see you. But you know something? When we're upset and when we're not right with the Lord, the devil will use that to disappoint others, to discourage others, and to hold back the blessing and the power of the churches. You see, Paul teaches us that we have a ministry. We have a ministry. And it centers around three tremendous, powerful things. Now, I want you to listen to me. This church can have an even more powerful ministry than it has now if we we'll remember three things that God wants us to do to make our church powerful. Number one, he wants us to worship God. He wants us to worship God. Therefore, our testimonies should bring glory to God. Our singing should bring glory to God. Our teaching should bring glory to God. Our special singing should bring glory to God. Do you see what I'm saying? Then the preaching of the Word of God. When we come through those doors, we will remember that He is here. And this is His building. He is present here this morning. Amen? And He is listening to your heartbeat, listening to what's going on in, your, in the, the depths of your emotions. He knows everything that Satan's trying to say to you. And so he knows that if he can disrupt worship, then you'll miss so much in the service. It won't go into your ears and it won't go into your mind. It won't go into your heart and it won't stay with you and it won't help you grow. And so Satan does not want you to worship God. Now, we can worship him through singing. I am so glad that we sing from the hymnal. I'm so glad we sing specials that are biblical. There's so many songs sung on radio and on television, they are not biblical. Oh, they've got a great beat and, wants, and, and makes people want to clap and get up and dance and, and all of that, but it's not scriptural. The words are not scriptural. Is God pleased with that? Absolutely not. I know I'm an old, I know I'm a, from the days gone by. I know that. But I also believe this Bible doesn't get old. And I believe it should be preached from cover to cover. Because I want our church to make an impact on this community and on the world. So the worship of God. Let's think about it this morning. Are we in this church really worshiping God? Are we as Christians really worshiping God? Does my spirit and my attitude project that I am a worshiper of God? Number two, the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. If we're worshiping Him, then we will want His wisdom. What decisions should we make? I'm going to announce at the end of the church that we're going to make a decision in two weeks about a matter. I want it to be bathed in prayer. I don't want to enter in my feelings, although that's part of it. I want it to be what God wants. I want us to affect this community. I want us to take the gospel to the world. And we're going to have to worship God. We're going to have to have His wisdom. How many times did you pray this week, Lord, give me wisdom? Give me wisdom to deal with that person that's giving me problems. Lord, give me wisdom to witness to my husband, my wife, my children. Lord, give me wisdom to witness at work. Give me wisdom to teach my class. Give me wisdom to be the kind of deacon that you want me to be, Father. Wives, are you praying that God will give you wisdom to be the wife you should be? Men, are you asking God to give you wisdom to be the husband that God wants you to be? And then the third thing is this, the will of God. The will of God. I want God's will. Let me say this. When I give the announcement this morning and tell you what we're going to be voting on in two weeks, do you know what I want you to do? I want you to immediately, immediately say, Father, I will pray for your will to be done, not mine. Now that's the way I'm going to pray. 
I'm going to pray that God's will will be done, not mine. And then when we make the vote and God speaks, then we want to accept it and move forward. But we want to know it's God's will, therefore I want you to pray. Don't walk out of here and not mention it in prayer. Get on your knees and pray. It's very, very important because houses are being built now near us. And by the way, uh, yesterday, uh, Brother Billy was here, and uh, Brother Mike was here, uh, and Brother Keith was here, and Keith and Billy, they went visiting in one subdivision. Mike and I went in another subdivision just right down here, a brand new subdivision. The same thing happened this Saturday that happened three Saturdays ago. Mike and I parked the car. We walked up on a hill, and uh, Mike was going to go to the end and come back. I was going to go this way, and there was a Jehovah's Witnesses. What they teach will send people to a devil's hell. What they preach will send people to a devil's hell. Do we care? Do we care? And I told Mike, I said, uh, I'm glad we're here, so we knocked on doors. Almost every door we knocked on yesterday, they either didn't come to the door or they were saved and going to another good church. And that's the way it happened yesterday. But what I'm saying is this. We need to worship God. We need his wisdom. And we need his will to be done in our life. Now, I want you to go to Ephesians, if you will, chapter 4, and look at verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4. Well, actually, if you will, <clears throat> actually, if you will, begin back up in uh, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because the blindness of their hearts. Did you notice that? We live in a culture where men's and women's hearts are blind, blinded to the gospel, blinded to the gospel. It's our responsibility to go out after them. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according According to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, watch what he says, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Listen now, we will never reach the lost. And we will never, never live together as brethren should unless we put on that new man. Now, that new man, God gave that new man to us when we were saved. But that new man is to be cultivated. He's to grow. And he's to mature. And he's to know the Bible. And she's to know how, the Bible and how to witness. And so you see what I'm saying here? The appeal here is to a dedicated life. Brothers and sisters in Christ who are dedicated to this life of taking the gospel to the world. I've, wrote, I've written down this. This appeal to a dedicated life is a present, decisive decision. Reasonable, intelligent, rational in making a decision. You see, it is a transforming and a continual process. Let me say it again. It is a transforming and continual process of change from the inside out. Now, I'm going to ask myself. <clears throat> I'm 74 years old. I've been preaching 54, 55 years. And I ask myself this question. Am I still changing from the inside out? I have, I have areas in my life I need to work on. I'll be the first one to admit it. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. And I know there are areas. And 
uh, I'll, I'll be out by myself and, and I'll have a, a, a battle in my mind and you know what I'll do when I have that battle in my mind? I'll simply stop and I'll say, Lord, renew my thinking, renew my spirit, help me say no to these things and say yes to that what's right. And then I know I'll be a more effective witness. I know God will be able to use me in a wonderful and powerful way. And that's very, very, very important. You see, listen to me now. The mind is the center of change. That's why the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Listen now. Let the mind be transformed. How well am I doing in the transforming of my mind? The word transform means a metamorphosis. A change from the inside that results in a change from the outside. My thinking has so much to do with that. And then it'll reveal through what I say and how I react. It's a very, very important thing. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, please. I want you to see these verses, and if you uh, <clears throat> haven't marked them in your Bible, please do so. These are verses that are just very, very uh, important. The book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, actually begin in verse 13. <clears throat> Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See how important Peter says the mind is? Verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Every day in my life, I still have some of those things that stayed with me after I was born again. Those things I battle and battle and battle, and so do you. So do you. But the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, will be able to make us these obedient children. Verse 13, 15. But as he which hath called you holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, or all manner, so that it will help us to change in our lifestyle. Read verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, and received the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, now watch, who by him who believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Now watch this. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit unto an unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God that liveth forever. For all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. Now watch. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And he is, and this is the word which the gospel is preached unto you. All of those verses tell us that we need to change and gives us an indication of how we can change. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I just want you to have some verses. 2 Corinthians chapter, <clears throat> chapter 3 verse 18. Well, actually look at verse 17 also. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Let me say this. Every time we come into a service like this on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, the devil is here with it. The devil's imps are here. And the devil wants to speak to your mind and get your mind off of what's said, the song, the word, uh, whatever it may be. And he says... Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and we need that liberty, don't we? But we all, with an open face, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. 
how much changing did you do this week? How much changing did you do this week? How much changing did I do this week? Every day we should be changing. Every week we should be changing. You know what we do? We turn a deaf ear. We just turn a deaf ear. I'm not going to listen. And the devil just loves it when he can get to blocking your listening to God. You're listening to the Holy Spirit. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Watch this now. Well, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Did you know God's given us weapons to fight with? Did you know Satan can get a foothold in your life? Satan can get a foothold in your life. It can be a mean spirit, a hateful attitude, an unthankful attitude. And he can get a foothold there. And you know what he does? If he's got that foothold, he'll use that foothold to get another foothold. And another, and another, and another. But look what Paul says in verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See how important that verse is? Now, Satan's going to get everything he can, get everything he can to get to your mind and mine. He doesn't want us to be thinking holy thoughts, righteous thoughts, godly thoughts, uplifting thoughts. Satan wants to get to your mind. And by the way, see, if he can get to the mind, then he can get to your heart. If the devil can get to your mind, he can get to your heart. You know, you can pretty much say this, you are what you think. You are what you think. You know, people come in here on a Sunday morning and they've already made their mind up. They're not going to listen to anything. But well, you know who the loser is? They're the loser. Preacher's not the loser. Sunday school teachers are not the losers. They're the losers. And I'm simply saying we need to be together as brethren, helping one another, loving one another. Now, I want you to do something. I want you to ask the Lord every day, beginning today, ask Him to help you to discern God's will for your life and to discern God's will for this church. Now, through the mind and with the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to do that. You see, our thoughts are the individual ingredients for living. They underline our actions. Are you listening? Our thoughts underline our living. They underline our actions and our feelings. They affect the body. They affect the soul. They affect the spirit. Can you imagine that? The mind. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, and he yielded himself unto death, even the death of the cross. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Now, we're on holy ground here, but through the mind, Jesus, through the mind, yielded himself to the Father to go to the cross. Your mind, you are what you think. You are what you think. I am what I think. And I wake up in the morning and I say, Lord, I blew it yesterday. Or I'll go to bed at night and say, I blew it yesterday. And you do too. You do too. Thinking about the mind. They're the, listen, listen. They are the bedrock of our spiritual life. Where are you spiritually today? Where are you spiritually today? Where am I spiritually today? 
In these years of preaching, I've seen some awful things. I've seen some awful things. I came to this church as pastor, and I've been here for about three or four years, and there was about six, seven families just walked in the door one Sunday morning. And after the service was over, they came up to me, and one of the men said, Pastor, said, uh, uh, we want to talk to you, not today, but we want to talk to you, a few of us men, and we'll talk for the group. We're leaving our church, and we want you to know that we've come here to check this church out, but we want to talk to you before we come. And so we did. And to make a long story short, we went in my office, and by the time those men got through telling me what had happened in their church, I couldn't believe it. I said to myself, that kind of thing goes on in a Baptist church? And they said, we can't take any more. Make a long story short, all of them joined this church. And they, when I left to go to North Carolina to pastor in Moose Baptist, they were still here. Making a contribution to this church. And that time, a gospel light dead this church. But Satan wants to get in our mind, in our thinking. Think about what a hasty word can do. Think about what a hasty word can do in a marriage. Husband to wife, wife to husband. Think about what an unwise word would be to your children. Are you listening? The devil get in your mind, the devil get in your heart, and you know there's no telling what he can do. Our thoughts define who we are. You ever thought about that? Our, our mind, it de defines who we are. And uh, it's not just by happenstance. Over a period of time, we've let our thoughts develop into a way of thinking, into a pattern of thinking. And sometimes it will take time it will take time to have the victory. And then our thoughts are crafted habits of the mind. Think about it now. Crafted thinking of the mind, the habits of the mind. Now, let me go and close now. I want to say this. Think about the influence of our thoughts. Now, this ties in to you and I as brothers and sisters working together. Think about our thoughts. Think a minute. Congregation of people in any church on Sunday morning. Okay? The preacher's preaching. They're sitting in the pew. They're thinking. They're thinking. I don't like that song. Look at what she's wearing over there. That's awful. That's awful. That's the grouchiest man I've ever seen in my life. Look at that grouchy face. It goes on. Thoughts. Thoughts. And the devil knows the power of thoughts. Listen now. God may have laid a message on a pastor. And that message came from God. And by the way, every godly man ought to make sure that his preaching is from God. I don't walk in this platform, I'm on this platform on Sunday morning with this idea. Well, I know somebody's done this and I'm going to blast them. I never do that. I pray every day, Lord, you put on my heart and in my mind what you want me to say. Don't let me say anything that you do not want me to say. And I know how important the thought life is. Your thought life can get you in trouble. And you can get very discouraged because of your thought life. Real quickly, number one, they affect your spirituality. They affect your spirituality. I've watched men and women on fire for God get into the wrong type of, think, type of thinking and pretty soon they're out of church altogether because their thought life was affected. They shape our attitudes. Our thought life shapes our attitude. 
What kind of attitude do we have? Is it spiritual? Is it godly? Is it uplifting? Or is it destroying? They form our character. They determine our behavior. They determine our behavior. In the home, at work, and at church. They change our environment and our emotions. They change our environment and our emotions. I love this church. I love this church. I pastored it for about 11 years now. I've been here in my, in, in my fourth year. I love this church. I love you people. I kid you, make fun with you, and I enjoy doing that, but I love you. I want God's best for you, and I want God's best for this church. It is my job as pastor to watch out for the devil and these demons. That's my job. It's my job to watch out for you, and if I see something that I think will hurt you, I'll come and tell you. All right, listen. Now, let me say this. It's your responsibility to look out for one another. You have a responsibility to look out for your pastor and his family, and you do. But you also have a responsibility to build one another up, lift one another up, and if you're going through it, they're going through a trial, you help them get through it. Amen? Here's something very important. Don't isolate yourself from the people of God. You know what you do when you isolate yourself from the people of God? You leave yourself wide open for the wolves. That's why a church has to have a pastor and deacons and a staff that loves the church and wants to protect the sheep from the wolves. And there are wolves all over the place. You'll see them on television, you'll hear them on radio, they're out there walking the streets. Soon I watched a movie last night, and a real good movie about two cultures, two cultures living close to each other. And there was fighting and killing among these two cultures. But to make a long story short, there was a man came in was not associated with either one. And through a process of time, affected both groups, brought both groups together, brought both groups together. And then it came time for that man and his family to leave. And as he was leaving, the people were weeping just weeping, please don't go. You have affected my life in such a positive way, please don't go. Do we love each other that way? You know why I'm speaking like this? I'm speaking like this because Satan doesn't want this, the missions to go any further. He doesn't want us to love one another. He wants to split this thing right down the middle. Now, don't, don't, don't get the idea that, th that that's what's going on, but that's what could go on. Watch, I'll, I'll say this to me when I'm saying it. Watch your spirit. Watch your attitude. I've been in churches when people will just walk right out the door and won't say hi to anybody. Won't say hello to anybody. They shun different people just going out the door. You know what? The Lord says, love our enemies. Be good to those that despitefully use you and persecute you. And it's a shame that Christians have that kind of feelings toward one another. I said all of that to say this. I want God to bless this church. I want us to reach the world with the gospel. With all of my heart, I want to see people saved. Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed, please? Everyone standing.